Welcome to this interview, Professor Murray Goldman. Well, thank uh, you. Actually, I don't know, maybe I could speak Swedish to you, because the story goes that when you got the news about the Nobel Prize in 1969, in October, uh, you prepared your speech in Swedish for the December day when the prize ceremony was. Is it true? Well, one thing about winning this award is that it increases the number of stories that people make up about you. Yes. <laughs> this is one more, yes. This is one more. No, what happened was that when I talked at the uh, banquet after the award ceremony, uh, one paragraph was in Swedish. Yeah. But you speak a lot of languages. How many languages you can? Well, that's not actually true. That's another story they make up about me. I'm very interested in languages, and I know something about the relations among languages, about the uh, about etymologies, about sound changes from one language to another, and so on and so forth. I'm very interested in that, and even uh, helping a little bit to work on it. But uh, as to speaking languages, any European waiter could do much better than I. <laughs> okay. Uh, you are a physicist. We understand. I'm a physicist, and um, I speak my native language fairly well, American English. Uh, I can speak French moderately well, lecture in it and so on, but I do make mistakes now and then. And Spanish, Italian are much weaker, especially in vocabulary. Uh, Danish, I can speak a little bit, uh, but I, uh, and when I'm in Sweden, I try to convert it to Swedish with sometimes with some success and sometimes with much less success. But your interest in languages, I would say. But I can read these. I can yeah. read these languages moderately well. Um, you have found that one word that has got the fame, I would say, and also was named in the Nobel Prize, and this is quark and quarks. Where yeah. does it, where does, did it come from? Well, let's see, in the citation for the award, uh, it was barely mentioned. But uh, I did propose that the neutron and proton uh, and their, uh, and the uh, related baryons were composed, roughly speaking, of three quarks each and that the quarks were the fundamental entities there, analogous to the electron, and that the neutron, proton, and so on were not elementary. The word was I had first as a sound, quark. It might have been spelled K-W-O-R-K, -K, for, for example. Uh, but then uh, I thought it was the right sound for the fundamental constituents of nuclei. Sounds, sounds good. Quark, but uh, then I discovered the word quark in uh, Finnegan's Wake. Of James Joyce, yeah. Right, and with the number three also, and there are, roughly speaking, three quarks to a nucleon or a baryon, and uh, I thought, well, uh, perhaps I can use the spelling there, Q-U-A-R-K. Yeah. So there it is. Yeah. So we have lived with quarks for more than 30 years now. Yes. But in you have moved your interest from theoretical physics to a broader interest of complexity. Can Simplicity and complexity, mm -hmm. regularities and randomness. Yes. Yes. Uh, and this subject, which I call plectics, the study of the simple and the complex, uh, includes a good deal that uh, has to do with physics. Uh, mm -hmm. Eclectics comes from the common root of the word simple and the, the word simplicity and the word complexity without uh, distinguish, without uh, specifying whether you're talking about the simple or the complex. I used to work on the simple only, that is the uh, fundamental laws of nature which we believe are fundamentally mm. simple. Quarks are simple. Right. You, but you have, yeah. but we see around us a great deal of individuality. Uh, we see around us uh, adaptive evolution, uh, as in biological evolution, for example, uh, but also cultural evolution, evolution of, uh, of ideas, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a great deal of individuality. Uh, 
These are not things that one finds in the, directly in the fundamental laws of physics, where, for example, every electron is uh, exactly identical with every other electron in the universe, and uh, where uh, we believe, at least, that the uh, laws uh, don't change uh, with time. The fundamental laws are immutable. In fact, some people now claim, just in the last few months, that they have found some evidence that uh, some of the supposed constants of nature are actually changing very slowly. But that's a, if true, that would be a very slow cosmological effect. But in the world around us, we see uh, lots of individuality and a great deal, a great many different kinds of evolution and so on and so forth. And we see a lot of complexity. So where does that come from? And in my book, uh, Kvarkin ok Jagvarin, yes. uh, the quark and the jaguar, I, uh, I uh, discuss this question. Uh, but the point is that the fundamental laws are, are simple, but they are not deterministic. Even at the fundamental level, they're not deterministic because of quantum mechanics. But besides that, they fail to be deterministic because no observer anywhere in the universe can have access uh, to all the necessary information for predicting the future. You mean so, deterministic in the... So, every, in other words, any observer sees only a coarse-grained version of the universe. And the coarse-grained uh, state at a given time does not determine the coarse grain state at the next time, only probabilistically. So we have to look at all the alternative possible histories of the universe as uh, a branching tree of possibilities with probabilities at the, branch, at the branchings. And uh, the great uh, writer, the Argentine writer, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, wrote a story about somebody who made a model of the branching alternative histories, of, alternative possible histories of the universe in the form of a, a garden of forking paths. El jardín de cederos que se bifurcan. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, this idea that the alternative possible histories of the universe, coarse-grained, of course, form a branching tree, means that the uh, history that, that is actually seen is, uh, is co-determined by the simple fundamental laws and by an inconceivably long sequence of accidents or chance events, which can come out in various ways. And... Uh, in advance, uh, one can predict only the probabilities of the different outcomes. Yeah. So uh, there, of course, is the source of complexity. Now, some of these accidents produce a great deal of uh, regularity in the future. Uh, and those we can call frozen accidents, things that, at least locally in space and time, create new regularities in addition to the fundamental laws. Now, Fundamental physics uh, relates to the basic laws, but the rest of physics and chemistry and especially other sciences like biology and geology and so on, uh, observational astronomy and so on, all of these depend uh, a great deal on the accidents, not just on the fundamental laws, but on the, all the rest of the information that contributes to the history of the universe. So, so how can you make models or theories of uh, the histories that are based on accidents? Well, we, uh, the fundamental laws give you the probabilities. Mm -hmm. so but you have to adjoin to that information a lot of information about the accidents that have already occurred, and especially these important ones, which we can call frozen accidents, which create a great deal of regularity uh, in the future. And the, by complexity, then, what I call effective complexity, we mean the length of a very concise description of the regularities of something. If I change the subject for a while, you have yes. traveled to the tropics and you were also engaged in uh, environmental issues? Yes, very much in trying to uh, preserve the uh, heritage of biological diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also somewhat interested in the preservation of cultural diversity, although that involves a great many more uh, 
paradoxes and uh, contradictions. But uh, I've worked hard on uh, trying to help with uh, the preservation of, uh, of biological diversity around the world. And of course, on land, uh, the greatest uh, diversity is found in the tropics. And also the tropics are full of uh, poor and, in many cases, overpopulated countries. So these are the main obstacles. So the, the, what, what is most important to preserve is in the tropics, at least on land. And also the dangers are greatest in the tropics. So a lot of our work has concentrated on the tropics. I've uh, worked mostly through the uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, based in Chicago. And this was maybe not so bad for you to travel because you are so interested in ornithology. Oh, yes. And uh, it was a very great field ornithologist, uh, Ted Parker, mm -hmm. who uh, joined me in, uh, over a campfire in Venezuela when we uh, invented the idea of the rapid assessment program, which, which has been quite useful in uh, nature conservation. The idea is if uh, a certain tract of land is considered for possible preservation as a national park or whatever, uh, how to evaluate the uh, diversity that's present and the, and the quality of the, uh, of the environment? Uh, to what extent is, uh, is this a natural area worth preserving? Now, the old-fashioned way, of course, of uh, looking at an area uh, was to have skilled botanists and skilled zoologists of various kinds uh, spend many years cataloging the various species and their interactions with one another and so on and so forth. The trouble is, by the time you do that, the area may not exist anymore. Uh, so what we did was to champion the notion of having certain very special field biologists, like Ted himself, uh, form teams to go in and rather quickly and approximately to evaluate the diversity and the quality uh, represented by the area. I have one last question about birds. What, what is your dream bird now that you would like to encounter? Oh, there are many species. Uh, I've seen less than 4,000 out of uh, 9,600 or something like that, <laughs> almost 10,000 species that are recognized in the world. But there are a few special ones that it would be wonderful to see. The, uh, the uh, Congo peacock, for example. Which lives in Congo? Yes. Oh, I see. Uh, for a long time, nobody could believe that there was a peacock in Africa. And, uh, Nobody has seen and it. And no either. outsider, no <laughs> European, had actually seen one alive until re quite mm. recently. I see. So I hope uh, that you one day. But I saw them in the Regent Park Zoo. It's probably the only place in the world <laughs> where you can see a Congo peacock in captivity. But uh, it would be wonderful to see one in the wild. Mm. Oh, I, I hope you will find it. Someday, Thank you. maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking your time with us. Thank, Thank you. you.